to. Hello, everybody, and welcome to a weekly media briefing and public health update with Montgomery County Executive Mark Elrich. I'm Lorna Vigeli, Hispanic Public Information Officer for Montgomery County Government. And joining us today is Dr. James Bridgers, Acting Health Officer, as well as Dr. Earl Stoddard, Assistant Chief Administrative Officer, Mr. Sean O'Donnell and Ms. Kimberly Townsend, both from the Department of Health and Human Services. And today we have two additional special guests, Gary Cooper, Montgomery County Fire and Rescue Service Division Chief, and Douglas Furstenberg, Chair of Economic Advisory Group. Thank you everybody for joining us, reporters, members of the media, remember to use the chat during the Q&A portion of this presentation. And with that, good afternoon to you, Mr. County Executive. Uh, good afternoon, and uh, thank everybody for joining us today. I'm going to start on a <clears throat> slightly different note. Uh, I want to note that Maryland Task Force One is in Puerto Rico um, this past weekend. Hurricane Fiona, I think as we know, hit Puerto Rico and the Dominican Republic and delivered a pretty devastating blow there. And the, it's the first big storm of the season, and it caused massive flooding and power outages across the entire island. Within hours, a Maryland Task Force One was called into action. <clears throat> this is a group of um, FEMA-approved search and rescue um, people, um, task force members, and it's made up of more than 30 firefighters and some civilians from Maryland, and nearly half the squads from Montgomery County Fire and Rescue Service. And on the picture, uh, you can see them departing from BWI Airport yesterday morning. They'll be helping local responders uh, to judge the stability of buildings and key infrastructure following the strong winds and flooding they experienced. The, the team's been deployed uh, in nine similar disasters over the past five years, and they were also sent um, to Oklahoma for the bombing there in 1995 and to the Pentagon in 9-11. Um, September is National Preparedness Month, and even though <clears throat> we've had a calm hurricane in tropical season so far, it was just 10 years ago when Hurricane Sandy hit the East Coast in late October. I encourage our residents and businesses to be prepared. I'll make sure you've got candles or battery flashlights and you know food and things in the event um, that a hurricane does wind up coming up the East Coast and uh, affecting our region. But so far, so good. And we're proud of the fact that the first call for help went to the Maryland Task Force One. And right now I'm joined by Maryland Montgomery County Fire and Rescue Service Division Chief, Gary Cooper, who's on the ground in Puerto Rico. And I'm gonna turn this over to him for an update. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So uh, minor correction, I'm actually here oh, uh, in the okay. county. I just got off the phone with the task force leader who okay. happens to be in Puerto Rico. Um, so a live report from San Juan. Uh, Everything the county executive just reported is accurate uh, and was confirmed <clears throat> less than an hour ago from our team leader who's on the ground there. The team is doing well. They're being held up at a local hotel in San Juan proper uh, and they're waiting for uh, any mission that they may be called upon. As of now, it looks like the outlook's going to be uh, the missions that they engage in will be more so of humanitarian aid uh, and not not uh, search and rescue at this time, although that's subject to change. Uh, they're teamed up with Nebraska's task force and the FEMA incident support team. And I'm available if I have any questions or you need some further clarification. Thank you very much, uh, Chief Cooper, for joining us today. Members of the media, this is the time you can present your questions for uh, Chief Cooper before we move into the other sections of this uh, media briefing. I'll give you a second for you to use the chat if you have any questions regarding this particular topic. Laura, I, I'm sorry to not use the Good chat. afternoon, Steve. Steve Bonnell, but that's David. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, Chief Cooper, do you know how many um, people roughly from, how many firefighters, how many people are down there right now? Yes, there is a 35 member task force, Maryland Task Force One. Uh, of the 35, 15 of them are Montgomery County Fire and Rescue personnel. The other 20 are made up from Prince George's County and Howard County. There's also a 35 member uh, task force uh, from Nebraska. Uh, 
that's as of now again as they continue to assess the needs okay. that is subject to change and increase or decrease and i've only heard a couple reports about this but i i've heard that it's pretty you know the water systems down there are pretty, were hit pretty hard is that when you talk about humanitarian aid is that i'm sure that's at the top of your mind in terms of you know just getting water people and basic needs like that that is correct there is no electricity or fresh water to the entire island um, so can you just, I guess the mission hasn't been established yet, but is that, I guess, what you anticipate in the coming days, you know, those efforts? I imagine we will be involved in uh, service delivery regarding water. Uh, we'll probably, if history uh, continues, we'll probably assist the local municipalities and utilities with debris clearance so they can get in there and try and restore some power. Any power that's on the island now is generated power. And how does this compare, I guess, the prior missions that the task force has undertaken so far? I know it's still beginning, but very similar, very similar. No, uh, Chief, thank you. That's all I had. Okay. Thank you, Steve. Kate Ryan, WTOP. You have questions for Chief Cooper. Yes, thank you. And uh, apologies, Chief Cooper, I'm joining a couple of minutes late, but I wanted to check in and and Steve uh, mentioned this as well. How does this stack up to the kind of missions that you've um, done before? Uh, I'm assuming the and I'm trying to remember um, the status for MCFRS down in Puerto Rico during Maria. Can you give us an assessment of how much worse, more severe this may be in terms of what the folks in Puerto Rico are facing? So we've been there, our team members have been there for about 22 hours now, and the reports we're getting back from them until this point is it's eerily similar to what happened last time there in Puerto Rico. It's almost, it's almost a mirror image. Wow. And do you have any idea of how long you might be down there? So when we uh, accept and are authorized to execute the missions, we commit to anywhere from 10 to 14 days, depending upon the need. Got it. Lastly, in terms of, uh, I know the, the county um, department has people who are expert in water rescue, et cetera. Are, are any members of that particular team down there? Yes, uh, that's a great question. As a matter of fact, it's uh, the group that went is a heavy group of water rescue with the anticipation, water rescue personnel with the anticipation of that need while we're there. Got it. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you, Kate. Members of the media, any other questions for Chief Cooper before he goes? <laughs> Going once? Going twice? No more questions? Can, can I make one point too? I think it's really important. So the, we often hear, well, what's the benefit to Montgomery County in doing this? Um, in addition to the humanitarian benefit that we provide by supporting, uh, you know, Americans across the, across the country and including in Puerto Rico, this is invaluable experience for the team as well. And they bring back a lot of the lessons learned and experiences that they have from going on these deployments and can apply them to how we respond to emergencies in Montgomery County moving forward. And so there is there is absolutely a humanitarian benefit. And we're just, we're, <clears throat> Montgomery County is consistently doing the right thing, whether it's on this or, you know, uh, immigration or assistance in any other way. We were up, obviously, we had staff up in Baltimore supporting their water outage a couple of weeks ago. And so this is part of a humanitarian mission, but at the same time, there are valuable um, techniques and experience and, and really training opportunities born out of these deployments that are invaluable for our team members who come back and apply those lessons learned uh, to the way they, they do these kinds of activities in Montgomery County as well. Thank you, Dr. Stoddard. Thank you, Chief Cooper, for joining us this afternoon. Mr. Okay. County Executive, thank you. Yep. So Go ahead. Thank, thank you, Gary, for joining us. And uh, I want to express my appreciation to the task force down there for their dedication and service. And we hope all of them return safely to their families pretty soon. Thank you. I'll be sure to pass that on. Yes, please do. Um, so the next topic, we're going to talk about uh, the speed to the market initiative we have in the county. Uh, the passage of zoning text amendment 2205 by the county council Tuesday is the first step in the county speed to market initiative. Uh, this is the first step we're doing legislatively right now. 
This new legislation will clear the, the way <clears throat> for offsite signs. <clears throat> it adds rules for temporary signs. It's a better fit for business owners who are frustrated by the current zoning ordinance regarding signs. Uh, these zoning changes are expected to save 45 to 60 days compared to our current guidelines. This is the first what we hope are uh, more forthcoming changes to make our, <clears throat> our business processing run smoother and life easier for everyone who lives and works in the county. These zoning changes are the first of the recommended made by our economic advisor group to be passed by the council. And following a listening tour that the uh, that Council President, President Sidney Katz and I conducted pre-pandemic. Uh, I then convened an economic advisory group in July of 2020. And the goal is to try to bring together a diverse group of business leaders to provide critical input as Montgomery County developed recovery plans for the COVID-19 health crisis. And uh, earlier this year, the economic advisory group released their ec economic roadmap to recovery and long-term success. And as you can see, it focuses on reinventing and expanding the talent pipeline to support shifting and growing industries. And, you know, we've made major steps with this. Uh, we have an MOU with Montgomery County, the University of Shady Grove, and the University System of Maryland to bring uh, education and career opportunities, as well as graduate level education in the life sciences to Montgomery County. Uh, We've continued to work with uh, the University of Maryland and bringing a uh, postgraduate uh, artificial intelligence campus to the North Bethesda metro station area. And this would be, you know, to focus on artificial intelligence, AI, as some people call it, machine learning, uh, the ability to process mass data. And it's to be focused on you know, primarily life sciences and also the hospitality industries. And there's a connection there um, just in terms of how data can be used, but we're really excited about bringing this to the life sciences industries in particular because it begins to change the way uh, research can be done and advances the kind of things that we've seen possible uh, over the past couple of years. So this is a big deal for the county. And uh, we know that recently the CBRE report ranked our region as number two in the nation in terms of life sciences talent. So we're trying to make sure we can continue to grow the talent here so we can continue to attract um, life sciences business here. And you'll see, or you know, at least I think we've mentioned this before, we've got over 3 million square feet under development and lab space. We've got many companies starting to come here now to call Montgomery County home. So there's lots of good stuff happening there. A second thing uh, that was a, a focus of the report was addressing access and availability of capital, especially so small businesses were able to stay afloat uh, from the impacts of the pandemic. Montgomery County continues to give out money and provide money to people who were impacted by COVID. We helped distribute state funds as well as our own funds earlier. And we continue to look to see what we can do to support local businesses, particularly creating relationships with local financial institutions who normally do this kind of funding and uh, trying to leverage some of our deposits uh, to help get more supportive terms for local businesses. Uh, we support you know, key quality of life industry components, restaurants, entertainment, and hospitality. And we've seen real growth in restaurants. Um, so we are, we've pretty much recovered whatever the number of restaurants we've lost. And then some, I know the, the couple of months ago, the liquor department talked about uh, proving a record number of licenses. So we're seeing a resurgence in many of those businesses. And our hotels are finally seeing a much higher utilization rate. Uh, Marriott was saying their properties have you know, really begun to recover now. So we are seeing what we hoped, which is recovery in that sector, which is one of the hardest hit sectors throughout the pandemic. And uh, supporting initiatives like um, Speed to Market and uh, dealing with our county zoning ordinance regulations are things we need to do to make sure that we don't stumble over our own feet. We've got to be sure that our processes are um, as efficient as possible. And I know that you know for a long time, this county has been perceived to be slow and difficult to get projects moving. And uh, the combination of a unique approval structure for real estate projects 
including an independent planning function and parallel permitting processes in the county has created inefficiencies and a lot of frustration. And the EAG recommended short-term solutions to lay the foundation for change and send the message that the county is ready to efficiently meet the demand of economic expansion with minimal red tape. And the significant shortening and streamlining of development approvals is necessary and important to promote this. Time is, in reality, money in the world of development. An unnecessary delay in approvals and permits delays the point at which a business begins to generate revenues. So to the extent there are things we can improve in this area, we really need to look to improve them. You know, I'm a believer regulatory processes are necessary. They do good things. But if the process itself is cumbersome and hard to use, or if the process <clears throat> it itself takes longer than it should take, and we have examples of other people able to process things faster than us, uh, we need to be sure that we're doing everything we can to process things as efficiently as possible. On Monday, I attended the opening of the new married headquarters in Bethesda, and it was a wonderful event and an incredible celebration for both this company and the county. Uh, Montgomery County is proud to be home to Marriott, and we're very grateful they kept their headquarters in our county and state. Uh, it was clear during their presentation that as they embarked on the beginning steps of this journey, they were looking regionally to see where they should land and uh, keeping the jobs in Montgomery County is a good thing. And during the grand opening, Merit leaders were once been very complimentary about our county's permitting processes and efficiencies as they built this $600 million facility. And this is the kind of feedback that we're hearing more and more often from business leaders. And this is the kind of feedback that helps Montgomery County change its reputation because their reputation was largely built by people talking about how difficult it was. <clears throat> no matter what you know, I say or the government says, the biggest antidote uh, to those old stories is being able to get people we work with now to tell stories of, of what improvements have been made so that people know this is coming from the people who have to use our systems, not just those of us who are talking about what we're trying to do. Um, Bill Marriott noted that when his father opened the first hot shop in the district in 1927, they needed a cut in the road curb cut so their patrons could access their parking lot. And he mentioned the district's local government not being able to provide that cut. Um, so who knows if that first store would have been able to survive and maybe the Marriott brand never gets off the ground. And parenthetically, I'll say when my, my mother was a waitress in the 50s and the 60s. Um, and she worked at the hot shops in, I think, both Silver Spring and Wheaton during that time period. So she uh, was familiar with working with the Marriott brand. Uh, this anecdote about the importance of local governments to work proactively with businesses, large and small, is still relevant 100 years later. And I've made it a priority here uh, to make sure we're helping businesses thrive and to navigate our processes so they don't become impediments uh, to their success. So I'm glad today that uh, chair of our economic advisory group, group, Doug Furstenberg, is joining us to talk about their work and the significance of this legislation. I'm very thankful for the input of Doug and those in the group. And I want to express my appreciation to the Montgomery County Department of Permitting Services and the Department of Transportation and Montgomery Planning for their work recrafting um, our approach to some of these issues. And I'm going to turn it over to Doug now. Uh, besides being chair of our economic advisory group, he's also the founding principal of Stonebridge Real Estate Development. And so also a Bethesda restaurant, I mean, res resident. And his wife does these amazing works of art. Um, and maybe I'll even tell you a little bit about that. But uh, <laughs> for now, I'll turn it over to Doug. I don't always brag on my wife. Um, but um, and she was the one who did the flags on the mall actually a little over a year ago for COVID memorial. But uh, to uh, what, what the county executive is talking about, it's been great to see the follow through of the EAG recommendations. The EAG was a very broad based group of business leaders from David Marriott to small business owners and everybody in between. And we came up with those guiding principles to not only get the county to recover from COVID, but how to move forward. And it's, it's gratifying to see ideas translated into action. Um, I'm a big believer in 
the quality of life in Montgomery County is phenomenal. I've lived here for three decades. We develop a lot here, um, but we need to build a tax base so we can sustain the way we want to live and to support the programs that we all have come to cherish. They need to expand. So when you look at the specific action, I mean, the sign ordinance of itself is not a monumental individual moment. It is, as the county executive talked about, another key foundational change. Uh, it was a 30 year old ordinance. It, there was no such thing as a video sign when this was created. Now people can properly do video signs. It sounds like a small thing. Think about how businesses run. Think about how businesses operate. Changing a sign every day and getting it approved doesn't work. So very happy to see it was a zoning rewrite. So this actually took a little longer because you know you can read the one pager and get what they did, but you know, it took a lot of work, as the cat exec mentioned, from lots of different agencies, and we love to see uh, that cooperation. And, you know, the AAG and, and the other business leaders are really thrilled to not only see administrative changes that have taken place. The park and planning agreed to truncate certain review periods. DPS has been working under the county executive's direction to look at shortening things. There have been several zoning text amendments to embrace our life sciences industry and get those built faster. Uh, and I think most importantly, as the county executive mentioned, one of our recommendations was talent. Talent is uh, a key driver for all businesses, big and small. And so embracing education, embracing uh, how we can create talent will be two things for Montgomery County, a huge competitive advantage and if we want to address equity in the county, it is how you create opportunities for um, people to grow and do better. Uh, every The one story I'll tell and I'll stop, your analogy is you talk to the head of U.S. Pharmacopeia, one of our great companies in Montgomery County. You think all they do is a review life science, pharmaceutical drugs. They must be all graduate and postgraduate employees. They're the, they claim to be the highest percentage of postgraduate employees in, the, in their sector, 40% have postgraduate degrees. So when you think what that means in terms of the range of talent they hire from entry level to postgraduate, if we can produce that talent across the spectrum, which has really been the focus of some of the efforts the county executive mentioned, that's gonna be huge. So speed to market, economic, uh, initiatives. These are great things for the county. Uh, many done, many more to go. We look forward to uh, seeing those ideas brought to the fore and implemented so the county ends up in a, in a stronger place and we can support all these wonderful programs we like. So I appreciate everybody's efforts to get another other recommendations implemented. Thank you, Mr. Furstenberg, for uh, joining us today. Members of the media, we're going to open it up again for Q&A with the county executive and or Mr. Fisterberg um, before we transition to the public health update. I'll give you a second or two to see if you want to uh, post your questions or request for questions on the chat. Members of the media, any questions regarding this particular topic? Going once, going twice. Okay, I guess we do not have questions about this topic. Thank you so very much for joining us this afternoon, Mr. Furstenberg, Mr. County Executive. So um, going into the COVID-19 update this week uh, in a nationally broadcast interview at 60 Minutes, President Biden drew a lot of attention by saying the pandemic is over. <clears throat> However, we also know that we still have a problem with COVID. Uh, personally, you know, it would have been better said if we had said the pandemic no longer has us in crisis mode and that we've got, you know, vaccines to manage it and we've got treatments and that we're more able to go about life in a more normal rhythm than we were before. But uh, the COVID, the pandemic is still here, or at least COVID's still here. It still produces too many cases and still produces too many deths. <clears throat> it's still worse than the flu. 
So we still have a lot of work to do and we don't want people to get complacent. I mean, my concern is I don't want people thinking pandemic's over. I don't need to get boosters. Uh, it doesn't mean that COVID is gone. It doesn't mean that it's not spreading in our community, as you can see, and we'll be able to see from some of the charts we put up. Uh, so it's still an issue. Um, it's more deadly, like I said, than the flu, and especially for people who aren't vaccinated. And that's probably one of the biggest issues we're dealing with. Our case rates are way down, but our hospitalization mortality rates from the virus you know, continue to be concerning. And those who stopped at just the first two doses of the vaccine are two and a half more times as likely to be hospitalized by COVID than people who are up to date on their vaccinations and boosters. So I've had uh, I just got my last booster this weekend, and I now I got the now available um, booster that deals with both the original virus and also um, Omicron. Um, that's really important, and it, it's um, they're available now. In fact, I believe it's the only booster being given out to adults. Um, <clears throat> the news on <clears throat> the value of being vaccinated is even worse for people who are unvaccinated. Their rate of serious illness, serious enough to cause a hospitalization is 10 and a half times higher than those who, who have been boosted and their death rates are also higher. So it's a high price to pay um, for not being boosted. Uh, <clears throat> we are probably about 66% uh, of our populations, you know, been boosted. We've got um, this large portion of the population that is still not adequately boosted. You do not now have to go back and make up all the shots you didn't get. You can simply get the new shot, which will boost you against both the original COVID and what we're dealing with now in Omicron. Um, we've got the vaccines. They're readily available in pharmacies and clinics around the county. <clears throat> so there are many opportunities for people to go out and get uh, the vaccine. And you know, our numbers are also concerning because we're showing that Black and Hispanics are not keeping up with other groups when it comes to getting booster shots, even though we know that the Hispanic population and Asian population led the county in getting vaccinated. Um, CDC has us at 90% vaccinated, but that does not factor in the people who have not gotten the booster shots. Um, we want to make sure everyone continues to take COVID seriously, but especially those who are most vulnerable. And if you are more than 50 years old, immunocompromised or in poor health, booster shots uh, can help protect you from the worst of this virus. And it's true that the variants can cause breakthrough infections, but vaccines still prevent serious illness and death, and even more so with the boosters. Uh, the truth is that most deaths in severe cases of COVID are preventable. Um, simply keeping current on vaccines seriously limits the likelihood that if you get a case, that the results are going to be severe. We should not be indifferent or complacent about the lives that are being lost, uh, particularly since we know how to prevent it. And I will say it, it kind of grieves me to think that people are dying knowing that if they had gotten a booster shot, they probably wouldn't be dying. And, you know, it's a loss to the people who know these folks, uh, family and friends. And when you lose somebody and you know you didn't have to lose them, uh, that's a sad moment. And I hope people think about that, um, particularly since we're in a, you know, a better place now to manage this. So please max your vax. <clears throat> you can find our clinic schedule at www.govaxmoco.com. Uh, on the monkeypox <clears throat> or MPX update, before I bring on Sean O'Donnell with the Department of Health and Human Services to go over our COVID numbers, I want to mention monkeypox briefly. I'd like to stress how important it is to continue to spread the message that MPOX is highly contagious if someone is showing symptoms like lesions. We're seeing it disproportionately impact Black and Latino men, which is why we held the town hall for the Latino community. And our next one will focus on the Black community. I'm now going to turn it over to Kimberly Townsend, Sean O'Donnell, and Earl Slaughter for their updates, and then we'll take your questions. Thank you, Mr. County Executive. Uh, <clears throat> there we go. I should be sharing my screen now. 
to take you through to start with the COVID numbers. Uh, again, we continue to track on the variant proportions. Uh, the, the one um, slight update for this week is the CDC now is tracking on uh, BF7 variant. Um, it is in very low proportions. And again, with our very low transmission rates currently, we're not seeing a lot of cases with this, but they are projecting that to increase over time. Um, they've also noted a BA 2.75 variant, uh, again, with very, very low proportions right now, but those are just two new variants that uh, the CDC has begun identifying and tracking. Uh, again, to, to reiterate, our, our case rates, our transmission rates for, with PCR testing um, are, have come down quite a bit, and they've leveled off a bit uh, over the last uh, few weeks. Um, our hospitalization rates, again, have come down, but now have leveled off, and we're still seeing um, higher higher rates now than we have during some of the previous spikes. Um, looking at the total ho hospitalizations, we had 91 uh, patients with a, a COVID diagnosis. Um, again, you can see from the chart here that the hospitalizations have come down a bit, but they've still leveled off. We're still seeing them occur. Um, we're still concerned, um, even as we go back to normal with a lot of our activities, that there are still um, portions of our population who get ill enough that um, they require hospitalization. And unfortunately, um, some are succumbing to COVID still. Uh, we're still seeing in our county uh, about one death um, per day. Uh, you know, Again, a lower rate than when Omicron first occurred, um, but we'd like to see this eventually come down. And it's, um, Again, this is why we, we are stressing staying up to date with boosters uh, as that immunity wanes. Uh, looking at total vaccinations um, based on uh, the, the CDC's projections now and um, our, our own uh, dashboard within the county, um, we now have 90% of our total population in Montgomery County um, who've, been, who've received at least the first two doses. Um, and of those who are 65 and above, uh, at least 80% have received a booster. Um, we're still, as the county executive noted, we're still, now we're starting to see a um, disparity between the populations coming out for those boosters. Uh, here you can see that at uh, the higher ages, disparity is not as much, but it, it's still between eight and 11% um, difference with our, our non-Hispanic, Black and African-American populations and our Hispanic and Latino populations um, being less boosted than our non-Hispanic, Asian, and white populations. Um, this is something we've reported on um, earlier, and we see those trends are even more market at lower ages. So again, we're hoping with the new boosters, we will um, we can continue working with our county partners, our health initiative partners, and our community providers to emphasize the important the importance of staying up to date on COVID uh, boosters. Um, again, those, those, just to, to go back to it, those, the death rates for COVID are still much more elevated than we're seeing for um, something like influenza. So even though we are um, moving into a more endemic phase now, uh, we, we're still concerned about the, the level of severe illness that occurs. Uh, now I'd like to turn it over to uh, Kimberly Townsend to give us an update on our monkeypox um, cases and response. Thank you, Sean. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, you can see that nationwide, we have over 24,000 cases of MPOX, and we are still seeing some new cases in the state of Maryland, which is why we continue to monitor the situation so that we can keep people up to date as to what we're doing in terms of mitigation. The good news is you're still seeing uh, that we're trending down in cases of MPOX nationwide. Um, through mitigation, we're hoping that uh, our continued uh, education around how to prevent the spread, um, how to provide or obtain testing and assessment, as well as vaccination and treatment, that we'll continue to see a downward trend. As you can see here from our Maryland Department of Health dashboard, um, we have uh, still accounted for about 12% of the cases of MPOX in our um, state. 
Um, and we continue to see the majority of cases in some of our surrounding jurisdictions. Also, oh, sorry, I just wanted to mention, we continue to see uh, the cases impacting particular populations are um, black and um, uh, Latino populations within our jurisdiction and the state. Thank you, Sean. So we continue to provide vaccination to priority one and priority two groups, which we uh, have previously mentioned. New this week, we are moving into our priority three group. We are expanding our criteria, meaning that we're providing vaccination to um, a larger uh, group of people. And again, um, this does include post-exposure prevention as we've provided in the past, but it, the new part is this is for folks that are pre-exposed or those with potential close contact um, and those that are highest risk for that. So that would include people of any gender or or sexual orientation with multiple uh, known or unknown sexual partners. We are giving priority uh, to those that are immunocompromised and members of those communities that are uh, impacted. And this includes our gay, bisexual, and other men who have sex with men, transgender men, and transgender women. So um, we do have vaccine to provide to those individuals that meet this criteria. Uh, we have increased our capacity and continue to provide vaccination at our Dennis Avenue site. And um, we encourage people to continue to use our pre-registration site located, um, you'll see the website listed at the bottom of the slide. If you think you meet one of these criteria, we encourage you to please go to the site and um, answer the questions for the pre-registration tool. And with that, I will turn it back over to Lorna. Thank you very much for uh, the public health update. Dr. Bridgers and uh, Dr. Stoddard, do you have any uh, opening statements? One, one quick addition to what Ms. Townsend indicated. Um, yes, we have sufficient uh, supply of MPOX vaccines and we've also opened it up uh, to sharing the, uh, those vaccines with our community partners, especially our community partners of color where we see higher cake case counts in our Latinx and our African-American community. So we have extended it to our community providers to increase access and equity. That's all I wanted to add, thanks. Thank you. And the only update that I have is uh, one of the big things through the pandemic that was really a true success for the county, uh, led by the county executives, a uh, real push for this was addressing food insecurity. And so I do wanna announce that we finally have uh, posted the, the director for the new Office of Food Systems Resilience as is open for recruitment. So we look forward to establishing this, this office as a mechanism to enshrine many of the lessons learned from the pandemic and really improve the relationship between the nonprofit sector that provides much of the food and the government sector, which can really help address the underlying causes of food insecurity. And so uh, we're, we're looking forward to recruiting that position, getting it hired and, and being able to move forward with, with applying some of the lessons that we've learned and, and expanding the partnership that we've really developed throughout the pandemic with our nonprofit and faith-based partners. Thank you, Dr. Stoddard, Dr. Bridgers. Members of the media, we're gonna open it up now for uh, the third portion of a Q&A regarding the public health update. Any questions? I do not see any on the chat. We'll wait a second. Members of the media, any questions for the officials today? I have questions on different topics. Are we at that stage yet? Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, Kate. <clears throat> Thank you very much. And I apologize, I just took a bite of lunch. Um, I did have a quick question on the situation involving the schools and football games and security. There seems to be some confusion or at least, you know, a, a, a need to understand police uh, presence at games, what is the baseline for that? And do you see that changing as a result of what happened on Friday night? I, you know, the school system is this, you know, has had meetings discussing this internally and they're going to make 
uh, decisions they think are appropriate in terms of how to make sure they have better control <clears throat> during the games. And, you know, we take the lead from them um, in terms of, you know, what kind of response they were, would want and how they want us to help them. Is there anything in the MOU that was signed between the school system and the county that would address this sort of thing? Again, basic baseline coverage or? So the answer to the question is, is no, Kate. There was, so this was intentionally left out of the MOU because there, the, the issues that we often have at schools during games are rarely have, are, rarely involve students. They more often involve adults in the stands. And so there was no uh, restrictions or anything, you know, with, with the CEO program, there is nothing in there in terms of restricting for special events. A lot of it's traffic control. A lot of it is uh, monitoring the activities of adults in the stands. And so we really, as kind of executive alluded to, we follow the lead for MCPS here. They, they provide us, you know, uh, we, we give them some recommendations around coverage at, at events, but if they want to increase coverage, they certainly uh, will work with them to do it. And I just would say with regard to the Gaithersburg uh, Northwest uh, incident, obviously it, it was in Gaithersburg. Gaithersburg police actually was the lead for security for that event. And so MCPD provided support and obviously provided a much greater level of support once things, uh, once the incidents began to occur. Uh, but obviously it is a collaboration often between the municipal police departments, the, the county police department and others to provide the security for these special events. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you, Kate. I see that Bruce Apoid from Maryland Matters has uh, his hand up on the Zoom meeting. Bruce, you have questions? Thanks. Good afternoon, Mr. Executive. I was wondering if you have any reaction to the um, selection of uh, Tudor Perini uh, to be the construction partner on the toll lanes uh, by uh, the Transurban Group. Um, not very happy. Uh, not sure what we're getting here. And, uh, you know, near as I can tell, I've only, you know, I just heard about this and there's been a little bit of information published on some of their past history and, you know, not sure they're best partners, but um, I'm generally, I'm, you know, not happy with the decision to continue to try to jam this through until a new administration comes in, can, can try to accomplish what the governor set out to accomplish, but accomplish it in a more reasonable way. I mean, I just wanna be clear, we're not objecting to doing the bridge at all. We're not saying you don't need to provide traffic relief on the Western portion of the Beltway or on I-270. Uh, we differ perhaps in how you do it. And we certainly differ over the way this contract was handled in general. Um, it's just, this is not a good process. And given our previous not so good experience with the P3 on the purple line, uh, we should have been a lot more careful about what we're doing. Does it seem likely to you based on the steps? I mean, with the record of decision and now a construction contractor, there is arguably momentum uh, that has been lacking till now, but there are still important steps that remain yeah. to occur. <clears throat> Do you see this as being a late December, January kind of uh, finish line uh, situation? And, and do you have any thoughts about that, if that's how it plays out? I think if it goes to the next administration, I think we're going to get a fresh look at it. You know, because, you know, Wes Moore has pointed out that, A, he wants to do something and doesn't. Again, none of us debate whether or not something should be done, whether it's this contractor and this structure of a 50-year commitment to basically bleed you know state and county uh, taxpayers of money for an incredibly expensive solution that's the thing that's under debate um there would be no you know i i believe and i know others believe that you could accomplish uh the goals of the project without doing this particular project when you said you weren't very happy, were you referring to Tudor Perini and anything in their history or track record or just the fact that uh, the state is continuing and, and, and its, and its uh, uh, concessionaire partner are continuing to move forward? You know, this, this comes without a whole lot of information on it. And so we're just now seeing, I've seen a couple of notes, you know, people made about issues that Perini's had in other projects. Um, Cost overruns, you know, not unusual for them. Uh, they seem to think that just cost overruns are a perfectly normal part of 
business, um, one of the things you try to do when you make a contract is to op- is particularly if the other party is going to be doing the design, <clears throat> that the other party eats the cost overruns rather than having uh, the state or county eat the cost overruns. So I'm I'm just concerned that we're just down to track focus solely on getting this thing approved without getting the best thing approved. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Any more questions from uh, the members of the media? I don't see any on the chat. Any requests for questions? Can I jump in here? Hi, Steve. Good afternoon again. Go ahead. Just one more kind of executive on what Bruce is highlighting. I know that the Sierra Club um, and other agencies have not um, ruled out litigation involving the process of the contract by two seventy project. Is that anything the county might get involved in from your vantage point, or is it up to the Sierra Club and those outside agencies at this point? I, th- I think it's premature for us to talk about litigation. I think we'll see what transpires over the next <clears throat> month or so, and uh, and then we'll decide what the best path is. I certainly, you know, I. I would start by saying I'm more than happy to be supportive of litigation if that's what it takes. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Any more questions? Members of the media, reporters? Going once, twice. Well, I guess we're done for today. Thank you everybody for joining us. Stay safe. We'll see you again next time. Thank you. Have a great afternoon.